Boy, I tell you, the left is exposing themselves unlike I would ever have thought possible. Their arrogance is out of control. We have Michael Malice joining us now. Uh, hi, Michael. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Uh, I want to talk to you about e- what's happening to Elon Musk. So he goes out, he buys just under 10% of Twitter. Uh, he starts talking about, hey, you know, we can we can free people up. Let's stop censoring people. The media goes crazy about some billionaire that just wants to change the world. Hello, George Soros. Uh, just wants what to a, ch- go what ahead. About Jeff Bezos. What about Jeff Bezos? Or, or Jeff Bezos, yeah. Um, and he's a danger to free speech. That's what they're actually saying. He's a danger to free speech. So yesterday we find out, this is from Charles Gasparino, as Elon Musk offers to buy the rest of Twitter, a legal source tells Fox Business that the SEC and the Justice Department have now launched what is described as a joint investigation into a myriad of Musk regulatory issues primarily involving Tesla. He is also... Um, uh, now not the largest shareholder because yesterday Vanguard, which is the second in line uh, for the top of the heap for the Great Reset, Vanguard came in and bought up a ton of shares. I mean, what is happening? Oh, and one other thing, uh, the the people in, t- in uh, Twitter have decided to sue him uh, for violations of... Uh, you know, not re- not revealing fast enough that he was buying these shares. They are I mean, terrified. They should be terrified. You know, I've said several times that Trump, they thought that Trump was the river, but he was the dam. What you're seeing is without President Trump in the White House, the consequences of the benefits of President Trump, which is an understanding of the enemy class mm-hmm. and an acknowledgement that people have to go on offense. And sometimes just going on offense simply means disrespect and invading spaces that they have regarded and decreed as sacred. This started back, uh, I can give you an example, um, when Jack Posobiec and Laura Loomer invaded the stage in New York, people don't even remember this anymore, I think it was Citibank, was sponsoring a Julius Caesar play in Central Park, New York City Central Park, where every night President Trump was ritualistically murdered on stage. Right. And when Posobiec and Laura Loomer uh, crashed the stage in front of the audience, this was regarded as heresy and like, how could you do this? How could you interfere with our play where we're murdering the president in Central Park? You people are monsters. So it's really a wonderful thing when spaces that they said this is our house we got rid of president trump from here we got rid of this person that person we silenced the babylon b uh you know now they're not feeling safe in their space they're in retreat and they don't know what to do themselves because for a century the republican party has played defense this and elon musk is no republican for the first time people are playing offense and they're losing their minds because losing that's minds. not the how the game is supposed correct. to go correct so what is what, what do you think uh, how does this end for elon musk and for twitter i mean basically their their idea the slogan of the great reset set should be if i can't have you no one will um, and and that's what they're trying to teach Elon. You are not stepping out of that box. We we have the financial resources to cripple you. And if that doesn't work uh, and shame in the public square doesn't work, well, then we have the government as well. Yeah, I, I, I've, all, I've said several times, and I'm sure you agree, Glenn, it's often or almost always preferable when authoritarian regimes have to show their hand. Yes. It's much more expensive for them in every way, uh, especially because moderates who you know don't really have a stake in the game and don't care one way or another, or people just apathetic, when they see the heavy hand of government uh, going down and, and they see things like this happening, it's going to alienate them be like, wait a minute, these are not nice people. These are nasty, aggressive people. We, people, we also saw it a couple of months ago when overnight Joe Rogan went from a n- nasty purveyor of misinformation to a racist. It was an overnight thing. Yeah. And they tried to destroy him that way and it didn't work. And everyone forgot that it didn't work. Uh, they tried to get rid of Joe and they had nothing to show for it. So Elon Musk is a very, very bright man. He's a tight cookie. 
uh, tough cookie, excuse me. Uh, I'm sure he's had to deal with regulatory nonsense before. I'm sure a lot of people in Washington also quietly have his back. So this is going to be very interesting to see how it unfolds. And Elon's not alone. There's lots of people in his circles or maybe, you know, two or three degrees removed, people like Peter Thiel, yeah. who know the nature of the game, people in for San, for San Francisco, people who are now in Austin, who are realizing this is what we're up against and this is how we're going to play. And I, I got to tell you, if you're the guy who thinks he's, you're going to put people on Mars, when you play, you play to win. You're not some dilettante. Uh, all right, let me let me switch topics. Let me go to your neighborhood in New York where you used to live and uh, what happened in your former neighborhood. Yeah, it's it's been a rough couple of months to get personal, Glenn, because first of all, the city where I was born, Lvov in Ukraine, was being hit by missiles. Mm -hmm. Then the apartment where I lived in New York for 16 years, I was half a block away from that train station, uh, got shot up. And then the next train stop just yesterday or two days ago, or rather, a kid was shot in the street. Uh, I've made this point, you know, it was a very hard for me to leave New York. I've lived there all my life. I still don't know how to drive. I moved to Austin over the past summer, as many of your listeners know. Um, I don't think people realize just how bad these cities are going to get. And if any, because there's no mechanism of turning them around. So if anyone out there, and it's what else is interesting is once you leave these places, you know, I moved to the nation of Texas, looking at this footage, it feels like I'm looking at another country. Because that was not the New York I knew. Like, obviously, 9-11 oh, yeah. happened, things like that. But in the sense of, you know, just, just, just this carnage and knowing, knowing what to do. And I point out the police were pretty much helpless to even catch him. It had to be some random kid on the street. And also, he turned himself in. And the, the other thing that's disturbing, which I, I wonder if you've touched on elsewhere, is every outlet at first mentioned his race. And then they edited it to remove it, including the New York Post, which is largely right of center. I have no understanding of why this is. Wait, 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 they edited after it ran? Yes, yes. I thought I was hallucinating and someone saw, showed me the cached footage. The New York Post originally had the identification, which everyone else had, 5'5", five, five, black male, 170 pounds, and then they changed it to 5'5", five, five, male. I have the clips. That is insane. insane. Yes. Yeah, this is a manhunt for someone who shot up a subway station, and thankfully no one got killed. Yeah, the, the New York Times, one of the stories I read, did not identify him as African-American, but just identified his writings and videos from the web as bigoted against blacks. That was it. Yeah. It was just bigoted against blacks, and especially black women. So no no mention of all the you know black nationalist supremacist type of stuff he had all over the place. None of that, and then didn't even identify him as black. So, I mean, if you're reading that, you're thinking for sure this is some white supremacist who's just bigoted against black people. They never, they they just intentionally I kept that you, out. Do you remember um, when uh, Riaz Patel came uh, by and uh, the first time mm. when we started to get to know him, he was a guy who was on the left. He was from Hollywood. And we sat down with him uh, and because he was trying to understand what was going on. And he re he started to... The world started to crack open for him because he was like, wait a minute, the, wait, what happened? And we sat down and I just put a chalkboard together and I said, do you know this story? No, that didn't happen. Yes, it did. Here's here's the story. This, this, this. We gave him like 20 different yeah. stories. He had never heard of them. I mean, you are just in the dark. If you're if you read The New York Times and watch CNN, you are the least informed human alive. But it's it's also disturbing to me how this has become pervasive across media. And in fact, there's several news outlets, I think including the Associated Press, where the explicit policy is we are not going to report on the race of a suspect if it's going to have people reach racist conclusions. And my concern is this is a manhunt. So I, I, if people reach racist conclusions, that's one thing. But we need to find this person who was on the loose, who had bombs at the time. And you know what? They, the FBI had this guy. They interviewed him 19 different times. Uh, but, you know, they were too busy, I, 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 I don't know, going woke and looking for white uh, extremists. You know, what do you say? We just look for extremists. Let, let, let's look for people that are threatening to kill people online. Uh, threatening to kill people in their neighborhoods. Let's look for those people. I don't give a flying crap what their race is. You know, YouTube, all of his videos were up. All of them. Can you imagine, Michael, if you would have said anything like that? 
you would have been gone immediately and erased from public record. Well, I'm an anarchist, so I've said some pretty bad things. But in, in, all, in all seriousness, how about uh, we just enforce the Second Amendment? Because if there were several honest citizens on that subway station who were, were packing heat, uh, things would have ended up very, very differently. That subway station, obviously, I'm very familiar with it. I've take it every day for 15 years, there's only one exit and it's a major hub. There's four train lines that go through there. So this could have been much, much worse, even from the smoke alone. I will tell you, it is phenomenal. It is a miracle that this guy goes in and shoots, what, 35 times and no one is killed? I mean, Michael, you've been on that subway. I've been there. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's almost impossible to do. Well, and, and just you with the smoke inhalation. I mean, he had several bombs and you know the gum jam, jam and so on and so forth. Yeah, it, it's a very, very lucky thing, and we're very fortunate. And it's also we're very fortunate that he didn't leave the subway and just start shooting somewhere else. I mean, there's the number of stations out there is is just dozens. So this is also very disturbing in terms of other types of terrorism, uh, because this he showed very clearly how easy it would be to do something like this. And uh, God help us if someone else gets the same idea. Thank you so much. Uh, do you celebrate Passover? Are you religious uh, at all or believe I, in God? I, 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 I do, I'm not religious at all. I'm not an atheist, though. Okay. Are you an agnostic or? No, I'm not a coward. No. <laughs> <laughs>